Kia ora, tēnā koutou. Uh, my name is Shane Clark. I'm the General Manager here at Neurolite. And uh, yeah, really want to thank you for joining us here today, our, our, our webinar. Um, so today's topic is, is things to consider uh, when designing roofs to meet the new insulation requirements for H1. Um, basically, you know, be aware of your unintended consequences of stuffing more insulation in your roofs. And um, I'm going to try and um, highlight some of the things to consider. Uh, I'm lucky enough today to be joined on the panel by Scott Squire, who is the Specifications Manager for Neurolite. And we've got John Davies, the Research and Development Manager from Oculus Architectural Engineering. So uh, thanks very much for joining us today, folks. We also have um, producer Jade pushing some buttons for us, which is great. Um, so H1 is a massive topic, and there's absolutely no way that we're going to cover everything today in this half an hour um, soiree. So um, what we do we want to do is cover a couple of key points. The first one is, is what is H1? Um, we're not referring to an American army truck. Um, what are the new standards for insulation? And what are some of the unintended consequences of stuffing more insulation into your roof space? And then lastly, we want to touch on um, what we believe is best practice to achieve the new insulation levels. Uh, a little bit about our webinars. This webinar is set for 30 minutes, plus we're going to have a Q&A session uh, toward the end there. So try and make this interactive as possible. So um, there's a little question, a Q&A button down the bottom there. If you've got a question, um, feel free to chuck it in there and we'll put it to the panel towards the end of the uh, little webinar we're doing here. Um, so because we do this webinar virtually, we don't have the benefit of coming into your practice and delivering sausage rolls. We've then, um, we've then taken that sausage roll budget and we've attributed it to a, a charity that our guest panelists gets to choose. So um, John Davies has chosen um, Tear Funds Ukraine um, Emergency Relief Fund is today's charity. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. You've made the world a better place. And we thought we'd um, make a, you know, a, a little bit light and enjoyable this, um, this donation phase is that um, what we're gonna do is every time we use the word unintended consequences, we're gonna uh, populate 10 bucks towards that, uh, <laughs> that charity. You'll see that that word unfortunately um, comes up quite a lot. Um, in this webinar here. So um, that's how we're going to play it. Um, a bit of um, lighthearted entertainment. Uh, so like I said, um, feel free to chuck in your questions and answers in the Q&A thing. Um, this webinar is NZIA CPD accredited. So there's a survey at the end there if you want to capture those CPD points for yourself for your practice. Right, um, before we kick off, we just want to run a quick poll to see um, who or, or if you are indeed actually designing to the new H1 insulation standards. So I just get to chuck that poll up and um, feel free to, to participate in that. So the changes came in in November uh, last year and we're in a bit of a grace period between now and November this year. So just keen to see who um, who's, um, who's actually currently designing to those new standards now. Give a couple of seconds to populate that poll there. Uh, for some reason, the poll isn't working at this stage, Shane. Um, okay. We'll try with the later polls. Yep, sure. Okay, no, good as gold. Um, otherwise, if you feel like it, um, you can also chuck it into the Q&A or the, or the chat section there. We'll also see that. Um, all right, let's kick off. Um, we've got these um, lovely people on the panel. Um, they've got some things to say. Um, obviously, we'll, we're going to um, let them speak. <laughs> uh, so we're going to kick off with you, John. I'm going to ask you so if you can sort of just explain what, what H1 is. If we just want to chuck into the slideshow mode there and we can um, you'll get you to, to tell us what, what H1 is all about, John. Great stuff. So, so what I really wanted to kick off and say is it's not insulation. So H1 insulation isn't a thing. Um, H1 is energy efficiency. That is the code clause. It's about using all types of energy into a home efficiently. So that might be for water heating, it might be for ventilation, and it might be for, um, for, for heating in uh, general. So that it means um, that we need to use insulation or 
do those things efficiently, which usually talks or you know sort of lands at the use insulation. But what I wanted to make sure that as we kick off into this is that we, we we're talking about H1 and the improvements or demands for more insulation, but the unintended consequence, which by the way is the fifth time I think already that's been said, <laughs> um, that that is so keyed in with insulation and air tightness and ventilation and heating. Now that's on screen there. I know I'm just reading that out, but we've, we've got to take this thing as a whole picture and not just change one thing. Insulation alone, uh, that's going to have some unintended consequences. We've got to be looking at how these things work together. Yeah, no, excellent. I think um, previously you sort of mentioned that if you can sort of put this into a bit of a nutshell, which kind of worked for me, was um, H1 is all about uh, retaining the energy in the building. Yes, and, and using it. So, so you know, mm. if we are heating, let's do that efficiently by keeping it um, in the first instance. Yeah. And uh, if, if you have had a chance to read through the, the clauses in H1 and E3, they actually talk to each other and they say, hey, if you, if you are going to um, insulate, make sure that you're looking at uh, draft stopping or air tightness, that's the same thing, um, different yep. stages on the continuum. But we've got to look at these things all together. So we're going to look at H1 uh, and if specifically in that the insulation, yep. but that's not to say that these other things don't, uh, yeah, don't need to be considered. Yeah, no, exactly. Like I said earlier, it's a, you know, it's, it's a massive topic and there's no way we're going to cover it in 30 minutes, um, although we'd love to, but uh, you know, everyone's got other things to get carry on with. So we're just really going to kind of Try and focus in on on the roof design part of it. So, um, with the H one, I understand there's a couple of um, methods, if you like, in in calculating um, the energy efficiency or, or how the building is going to perform. Uh, yes. Talk about that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to kick into that. So so we've got three methods of showing compliance with the new regulations, and so they, these haven't actually changed. Uh, so, so I just wanted to quickly cover those. So the right. schedule, the calculation, and the modelling methods. So the first two, and it's the first two points there on the on the main bulk of the slide. So that is the schedule method. Um, it's looking at each individual um, assembly or part of a building and making sure that is as uh, the same as a reference building or slightly better. Um, it, it, it really is quite a separate what you don't get out of that, and this is the key point, you mm. don't get an idea of how the building will actually uh, perform. So you don't get an energy required to run that building. You don't find out um, whether it will overheat. Um, you, you're not finding out whether it's um, sufficiently ventilated. So all of those things can be but not in the first two methods. So the second method there, the calculation method, it's mm -hmm. very, very similar in that we're still comparing with a reference building, but there's an ability to do a bit of an add up and a trade off. So that's, that's okay, but again, it's just getting to a compliance um, point on this, uh, on the H1. Um, when we get to the modeling method, what we're doing there is we're modeling, we're still comparing it to a reference building, but we're going to find out a whole lot of, which is, this is why we're strong advocates of using the modeling method. You find out what will actually occur in that building. And we might even find out, and this is totally possible, that we don't need R6.6 construction R value in the roof. Now, I'm jumping the gun a tiny bit to where we're going within the presentation, but this is why we would do this. Let's find out how the building will perform at design stage. If we find out at design stage, we can make little tweaks. So we might improve a window. Uh, we might improve all of the windows. We might look at decreasing a bit of insulation in one area um, and increasing it in another, but it's, but it's about what that model is telling us to do, not about compliance and guesswork. Right, so obviously a lot more accurate than um, you know the other previous methods. Yeah, there's an output which is far more useful. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, useful, useful. Oh, good one. Um, so Scott, I was going to get you to um, touch on what what's new. Um, what have they done? What what are they? What, what's what's yeah? We quite often get asked what's new. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's new? What's what's new? Pussycat. Um, yeah. So yeah. In terms of climate zones, so previously under the old standard, we had three climate zones. There's now six climate zones. Wow. Um, the new climate zones are based on thermal modelling 
of buildings using NIWA climate data files from 18 climate stations um, throughout the country. So in short, we now have climate zones that are based on uh, physics and they make sense from a, a climate view. Whereas previously, the old three, um, really it was largely based on a, a bit of a one size fits all sort of a, an approach um, and also population played into that as well. So the, the aim really is that we're going to be designing and constructing buildings that are better suited to the location in which they're, they're built, really. Yeah, right. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, what, what, what are, I mean, so, so those are the zones and I think the next slide talks about, um, so, so what are the new thermal resistance yeah, so just to give a bit of an overview there, so looking at H1, uh, AS1, residential small buildings. On average, we were looking previously for a roof that was a, about a, an R3. Uh, and bear in mind, that's a constructed R value there. Um, right. Now 6.6 .6, uh, across the board. So right. somewhat ironically, we've now got six uh, climate zones, but we've just got the, the one um constructed our value for the roof mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's over double uh, of what it used to be consequently the insulation it's either going to need to be thicker uh, or higher performing um, the other way in which that can be achieved and, and john's alluded to it is the way in which we're actually using that insulation in the roof space there so how it's installed Will obviously have a, an impact on that um, overall constructed R value. So, yeah, all in all, it's a, a positive thing. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, I think we can all agree that it's a step in the right direction. Whether uh, you know, it looks a little ironic that they've gone and divided up six climate zones now and blanket it with one R value, but hey, you know, it's a it's just definitely a step in the right direction. Um, yeah. Yeah, and look, it's all about reducing energy consumption and mm -hmm. ultimately, I mean, improving standards. Cool, and um, so this is for small residential type buildings, sort of uh, 300 square metres or less, and I've got another um, series of values for larger buildings. Yeah, so H1, uh, AS2, uh, large buildings over 300 um, square metres. We're seeing even larger increases there with the R value on the uh, the previous requirement. Um, an example there you can see zone six down in Southland, it's quite significant looking at a, an R7. Mm. Um, in terms of the residential, going back to the previous slide, the, the aim there is to reduce energy required to heat those buildings by 40%. Whereas with commercial, uh, the, the aim is for approximately 23% energy reduction to heat and cool those buildings. So that's that's overall. Right, okay. Um, that'll um, be interesting to see how we roll that out commercially uh, throughout the country. Yeah, think, um, absolutely. John, do you think those, um, you think those R values are, um, are gonna make a difference compared to what they were from your perspective? Oh. Look, of course they're going to make a difference. It's a it's a thicker jacket. It's a it's a better duvet um, on the building. What's super interesting from my view is that this doesn't really take into account a surface to volume uh, ratio. So as buildings get bigger, mm. and we, you know, if you think about say an apartment building, there's actually a possibility that you need less insulation on the outside of those buildings, uh, not more. Now. No. I mean, we're talking about roofs here, so it's a slight bit difference, but there's, there's some really intriguing practical uh, ways that energy moves out of those buildings. And, and we need to consider, uh, again, great reason for modeling a building, find out what it will do, not just think, oh, it's bigger, let's put more insulation in. Actually, that's sort of, it's the, possibly the wrong way around. Yeah, yeah, no, excellent. All right, we're about to, uh, to jump into some potential solutions that comply with these standards. Uh, but just before we do, if we just flip to the next slide, um, what we want to illustrate here is what we consider a, a, best, a best practice approach to, to roofing. So uh, we want to sort of plant the seed before we go down the avenue of showing you how, how these other types of roofs can comply. But basically what we 
can all sort of agree on is that we're looking for a couple of things for the roof to do, uh, for a high performance roof to do. The first thing is that green line there is your vapor control layer. That's important in a roof build up. Uh, the next layer is your, your insulation layer or your, your thermal blanket layer, um, again, which is important. And then of course, on the outside surface, we need our, our weather barrier, uh, whether that be um, uh, tiled roofs, uh, membrane, corrugated iron, whatever it is. Um, that's what uh, we're looking for in, in an ideal roof. In that order too, um, you don't really want your insulation underneath your rain jacket there. So. Uh, right, so we're gonna fly into the, um, these types of roofs. So we're gonna start off with a, a typical cold uh, vented attic roof. So we'd see this roof type typically on a residential building. Um, I think the next slide sort of shows a bit of a cross section. So we've got a, like my house, uh, I've got a ceiling. On that ceiling, I've got some teddy bear stuffing and then I've got um, some trusses that hold the steel skin um, up off the, onto into a pitch. So that's what we're looking at there. Yeah, and Jade, if, if you can just flick onto that next slide there. Yeah, so in, in terms of that build up, as you mentioned, Shane, we've got the, the lofted insulation there at the, the ceiling line. So in this case, it's a, a high performance lofted insulation material. So it, it has a, a lower thermal conductivity compared to a, a standard lofted material. So it's thermally more, uh, well, not thermally more efficient, but it'll certainly reduce heat flow through it. Um, the, the two layers, the, the first layer is seated, friction fitted there between the framing. So that's framing there is obviously going to provide a, a thermal bridge. So that second layer installed over top, you can see in the render there, it's perpendicular to that first layer. So we're offsetting the layers to hopefully reduce any thermal bridging there. But um, going back to that sort of perfect scenario that we had with the, the vapor control layer in the earlier slide there, this particular builder, we don't have a, an independent um, vapor air control layer. So in terms of that moisture rising up through the builder, uh, yeah. the building into that cold attic space obviously there's a, a risk that that will hit the underside of the roof which which will be cold at times and mm -hmm. uh, condensation can form which isn't good I mean that obviously that can lead to to mold growth uh, you know it, it can rot framing all sorts of bad things so in terms of that that cold air space there it's important that it's ventilated so we're addressing that moisture um, that's going to occur that's yeah. going to pass through there and just a bit of a a background there um for everyone out there uh, we we class scott as our expert in this field and um, while he was a student he was paid 50 cents a square meter to stuff insulation into ceiling cavities so yep inside a few the late 90s yeah it was a good time to be alive 50 cents nice. a square meter um <laughs> lying over insulation so yeah and yep. on the back of that shane there is definitely a health and safety thing that needs to be thought about here you've got a significant depth of insulation to meet that new requirement so yeah yeah so what are we saying with this roof we're saying that the so this the, one this yeah this one technically can comply yes, we can yes. get we can absolutely get 0.6 so winning but what are the unintended consequences? Yeah, so what we've got, as Scott's pointed out, is we've got this moisture load, and we saw that in that last slide. We've got the a heat, uh, you know, a heated area underneath that ceiling, and that also has humidity in there, and that's being driven up through that ceiling space. Now, you might think, well, hang on, it's got plasterboard there. It's got it's got a, a layer to well, that layer is not continuous. As soon as you put a hole there for a power, well, not a power point, but a, a, a light. Um, certainly a hole for a downlight, you've got access for air to move up into that space and the risks occur. So if, if you just think back a step, if you have no insulation in that space at all, you actually have a warm attic space because you're heating underneath, assuming you're heating underneath, and you'd actually have warm, um, you know, even, even the tin, even the corrugated iron might be warmer than it would otherwise. So by insulating, we're actually making that space colder. 
And by making it colder, we've in, introduced or increased the, um, the, the likelihood that condensation will form in mm. that space. And so what we're looking at here is the idea of, you, you can make this comply, you can put more insulation there, yeah. but you're not actually making this work. Um, you know, there's no way that you could confidently say this will work from a hydrothermal. So that's, that, that's the moisture and heat component going through this um, you know, through this assembly mm -hmm. or through these layers of insulation. And so the risks, um, I don't know whether four, so number four in that diagram is actually about that particular point is about where uh, the, the real risks of condensation forming are going to occur. Now, yeah. if that top layer wasn't there, if it was just a skinny bit of insulation or skinnier, you know, just 140, the, the condensation, that risk point is still in that insulation. So adding more insulation doesn't remove the risk of condensation. Yep, exactly. So um, I get, I'm watching the questions come through while we're talking here, and um, a lot of them are pointing to, you know, um, lots of questions about this build-up, and that's great to see. So, I mean, the, I guess the point we're making is this roof will technically comply with the new requirements of 6.6, .6, and all your questions are completely valid. Um, that's got to have a lot of um, unintended consequences um, by doing this, which we've kind of covered. So um, when we, we'll just crash on and we're going to roll on to the, the flat roof, I guess. Um, obviously seen, uh, this is our bread and butter, to be honest, um, seen on large commercial jobs, high and residential, um, anywhere where we don't need a, a steep roof pitch, um, we can, you know, you can actually use the flat area. So that previous slide is actually um, the, the um, Westgate Library, which has a, an outdoor deck slash green roof, uh, usable public area on it. So um, it's all areas where you'd see a flat roof. And um, Scott, yeah. you want to explain what we're seeing here in this build up. So the, the build up is a um, traditional, what would consider a, a cold roof with lofted insulation fitted between the framing there. So as per the, the previous build up, we've got now, in order to meet that uh, 6.6, .6, we've got quite a significant depth or thickness of that lofted insulation. We've got thermal bridging because of the, the framing there. And as a consequence, uh, we need to increase the lofted insulation even more. Mm -hmm. the, the plywood there, the, the substrate has a, a membrane, a uh, bituminous membrane there. So that acts as a vapor barrier and doesn't allow moisture to dissipate. So in terms of this build up, it's certainly the, the less favorable approach. And it's really a bit of a, a adopt at your own risk really, because it's, it's critical that there's sufficient ventilation um, to manage the moisture that's going to occur within that build up. So yeah, it's, um, What's the One message bit. here, Scott? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Look, at, I, at your own risk, right? At your yeah. own risk. So if, again, if, this, this flat roof build-up will comply. Um, you can get it to comply. Um, however, it, it's fraught with danger. So um, not sure if we covered that in this one, but um, you know, when we first looked at that, uh, the perfect roof scenario before we dived into this, um, are we classing the, the ceiling line as a vapor control layer? Are we no, no. So plasterboard is not. Plasterboard is actually really vapor open. So it's going to right. allow moisture to diffuse through it as a product, mm -hmm. even if it's got paint on there. Um, but more, more importantly, because the diffusion element is quite slow. But if you've got gaps or cracks or joins or, or again, you know, down lights in that space, you will have moisture moving up into and towards the cold surface towards the outside where it can't get out. So if you want to grow some mould, that's the roof to try. Do that one. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we kind of nicknamed this one the mushroom farm. Well, I call it a biodiverse roof. Um, I guess the other point to make is that once you've got condensation or moisture within that build-up, um, it's really going to deplete the efficiency of your lofted insulation, isn't it, once it's, once it's damp, which will then probably just continue the cycle of con condensation and... Yeah, and maybe just to point out that it's it's actually uh, possible to make that roof work. It just mm. is really risky. Like it's just not worth. You could use a vapor control 
layer at the underside of the insulation there, um, sort of just behind the plasterboard. Yeah. But again, you'd need um, you know, effectively no shading uh, to occur on that roof. You'd have to have full sun. There's a whole, it's, too, it's too complex um, yeah. to, to be confident that we can make that work all day, every day, any building. Yeah, okay. Oh, cool. So I flick to the next slide, and what we're looking at here is uh, another variation of the flat roof, Scott. Um, yeah. So this one looks different to the last one. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a better approach to so adopting a warm roof design. I mean, in terms of that water shedding layer, we still have a, a bituminous membrane. That, that could be a waterproofing uh, a TPO, single layer TPO, as well as a, a two layer bituminous membrane system. But one of the key differences is that we've actually shifted the insulation outside of the roof structure. Um, we've introduced an independent vapor barrier there, which is seated uh, between the insulation, which in this case is a, a PIR insulation board. So it's a much more higher performing material compared to lofted insulation. Therefore, it can be thinner uh, to meet uh, that um, that R6.6. In this case, the build-up is a, a 150mm total thickness of PIR there, so we've got a layer of 80 and a layer of 70. Um, and by shifting it outside, so having a warm roof, the um, roof structure itself isn't getting cold, so we're reducing the risk uh, of any interstitial condensation forming within the building there. So it's a a much better way to go. It's a, a common approach overseas. I mean, we've been advocating warm roof design for the best part of at least 12 years now. Um, and it's certainly something that we're seeing in light of the changes, uh, great in, uh, inquiry from architects, designers, specifiers around warm roof design. How can we make this work to suit projects? Yeah, right. And just from um, your perspective, John, um, you, you prefer this type or this type of concept? Or um... Yeah, there's a couple of really uh, critical things going for this. The, the you know, We've already pointed out where that insulation sits. It's outside the structure. That simply means it's continuous. Uh, it's a dense enough product, and I know that we've got some photos coming, so I won't spoil that too much, but the density in there um, allows for some really practical uh, ways of using that product as well. But I want to just point out that in this, um, in this diagram, compared with the last, the plywood layer doesn't um, have the risks of condensation forming on on it, on that layer of ply, because it's warm. So mm -hmm. the plasterboard is warm, that cavity at number three is warm, the plywood is warm, it, it's actually, uh, that's, that's why we're looking at this and calling this a warm roof, because the structure is warm. The insulation is continuous and we've got drainage um, layers outside that. What's really important to note with this, and it was shown in that very first uh, image that we had, at the start of the presentation, the the PIR is enclosed. It's 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 wrapped up with the mm. the vapor barrier, which is at yeah. number five in this diagram, and the outside layer, the number eight. So that's that's a really key part of making sure that moisture doesn't uh, become a problem. So that's that's a good layout. That's a good building. We need to make sure that we're connecting or able to connect that insulation down mm -hmm. into the walls. So we yes. want to try and maintain some form of continuity there. But yeah, really good start, really high performance. Good. And, and, and just, and just to compare, what well, at compliance, yeah. So, you know, if you've got um, fluffy insulation, we know that to meet this R6.6, you're looking at round about 300 mils of insulation. So this is 150. So suddenly you've got a much mm. thinner um, insulation buildup. It's it's a good it's a good outcome. Yeah. No, nice, nice. So we just go to the next slide there, and we're going to show. Um, I guess it's a it, it's a, a, a we call this a hybrid warm roof system. Again, we've got the uh, you know majority of the insulation on the outside of the structure. Um, we've got a vapor control layers. Um, this this will comply with we'll get your, your the R values you require. Now there's something there we need to be um, mindful of there, John, and it was uh, your, your bit of a math lesson on 
Uh, no, it's so pretty simple. So what, what you've got here is, let's, let's say it's the same um, amount of insulation in total from that last slide, but now we've got a slightly thinner roof build-up. So we've got insulation, well, less insulation outside, but a little bit inside. And I say a little bit, the, the, the really safe rule is to have one-third of the insulation value, and bear in mind that these are two different insulation products, Yep. So we've got a high performance PIR on the outside, a lesser performance, um, even though it's called high performance blanket, but it's a lesser performance um, insulation blanket uh, on the inside. So the maths there is one third of the R value inside the vapor barrier line, which is number six, and two thirds outside. So that's really safe to do a one third, two thirds rule. If you, and, and quite confident to state that that will work, um, but we can run some analysis on that if need be. If you wanted to look at 50-50, yeah, it's possible, but it just starts to get towards a level of risk, which might not need to be there. Yeah, and, and I know that myself and the team, this approach that we're looking at here is certainly something that we're seeing a lot of um, specifiers talk about where there might be height restrictions. So looking at trying to keep that PIR thinner mm -hmm without obviously introducing any risk there. But um, yeah, I, I see this option as, as one that will be, uh, we'll need to look at, but it's gonna be somewhat popular. Yep, no, absolutely. And uh, like John touched on, if, you know, if we're not sure, we can model it and we can tell you the answer. Mm. Um, so I'll just skip to the next slide. I'm sorry, I, I appreciate we're, we're pushing for time here. So the next slide, unfortunately, not everybody in the world like me loves a flat roof, um, that's okay. It's their own. Um, some people like to put their roofs on a, on a decent pitch. And uh, here's just a, an interior shot of a, of a skillion roof with um, some exposed rafters. And uh, this is actually the Kadrona project um, with the Bodo timber, if anyone's familiar with it. Um, this is from one of our previous webinars. So um, what we're seeing here is a, is a massive internal cavity. There's no ceiling lining as such. Um, John's favorite part of this picture is that the steel structures also inside the building. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we obviously we're able to keep that warm as well, so we're not going to have the, the you know thermal bridging issues that a steel member could um, introduce to a building. Um, so we just go to a, a I guess what we call a a typical skillion roof build up. What we used to do with lofted insulation. Yeah, looking at there, Scott. Yep. So lofted insulation. Um, it's relatively thick, obviously. We talked about the PIR being high performing, so the lofted insulation thickness uh, is approximately 250 mil thick to meet the new R6.6 requirement. Uh, we've talked about that airflow is important, so the, the roof battens that we see there, mm -hmm. they allow for ventilation, but overall that build up is, is relatively thick so it's quite um quite cumbersome it doesn't have that vapor control layer that we've talked about that's that's important um therefore yeah we need to think well how are we managing that uh that moisture yep for sure so we just jump to the next slide um this one here is um i guess our ultimate answer or what we believe is our best practice to solving a, a skillion roof design. Yeah, so in this case we've got PIR insulation board, therefore it's relatively thinner to meet that, um, that R value, it's continuous, so there's no thermal bridging there. We've also introduced the, we have an independent vapor barrier between the PIR and the plywood supporting substrate there, so that's stopping any moisture uh, coming up into the build-up. With this system, with the Gerard uh, system, <clears> that <throat> also has a, a building underlay on top of the insulation there, and that just helps to provide a degree of repellency for any moisture and aid with, uh, with drainage there. So that's, this is a, a better way of approaching it. And look, I mean, that doesn't necessarily need to be tiles. It could be a different sort of roof cladding as well. Yep, no, excellent. And um, John, this, um, this build-up will comply, you think? This will get your 
Your well, it's the same as what we were looking at with the warm roof, but yep. we've just put a different cladding on the outside. So exactly. whatever um, you like on the outside, all of the work yep. is being done thermally in that layer of insulation as an un unbroken. Uh, and, and that's the key part, right? The yep. insulation layer is unbroken. It doesn't have thermal bridging running through it with structure. Yep. And every single one of these best practice approaches that we've shown have also shown a, a continuous vapour control layer as well under the insulation. Um, right, we're going to jump to uh, commercial roofs now. Um, now, obviously, we saw earlier on, and Scott was talking about the, the R values required for commercial buildings. So um, they weren't um, they weren't forgotten in the um, in the new requirements. Um, what are we looking at here, Scott? Yeah. So this particular arrangement, I understand it's relatively new to the market, but it's essentially a lofted insulation between two metal trays here so i guess in terms of um that moisture management or or risk mm. it um it's probably quite important that that base tray layer there is airtight so we're not um, seeing any vapor getting up into that build up um airflow is, is really critical for this to function properly um yeah there's not a lot of redundancy there for uh, if the building leaks or say if it's in a high humidity type building it, it might be a pool complex it's yeah there are a lot of associated risks with this build up the other thing that we see there is the lofted insulation is disrupted there's a, a steel section running through so that's a, a massive thermal bridge there um, being steel, that's a uh, very effective. Yeah, so uh, John, you were, John, you were saying earlier on um, when we were running through this that that's your was it your most favourite or least favourite part of the right, of the roof? So because we're using lofted insulation that uh, is soft and squishy like a, your teddy bear stuffing, they have to put these steel legs in to keep the two metal skins apart. Yeah, so that that structure that in this diagram that steel. Uh, that steel is really highly conductive. Mm. So you've got really good insulation uh, and then you've got really poorly performing uh, steel. So that's mm. going to, I mean, technically you could make this comply. So this is this whole trade-off thing with what that's doing. But I'm not, um, yeah, w without, I mean, I can't guess that. That's a, it's a case of having to, having to calculate and work out what's going on there to make that comply um, you when you have right? to. Yeah, well, when, when you have to consider how much uh, conductivity and how many pieces of steel there are in there and what that's doing with the heat um, from the inside towards the outside. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, the next slide we're actually going to show um, there is a way to successfully do uh, a commercial roof that complies with the new requirements. So, um, yeah, so this is a, a, a brands appraised. Um, system tricore by by diamond and it uses anatherm pir that that we supply so we have that nice continuous layer of pir insulation board there you can see the um in the slide the tradesperson standing on the pir so it's a pir will withstand lightweight uh, sorry light maintenance traffic there so it has much greater compressive strength we also have a building wrap layer there in between the top metal cladding and the PIR insulation board in conjunction with a, um, a, a counter batten there that's ventilated. So the batten is vented to allow air movement um, and condensation control. Uh, excellent. So we're obviously minimising thermal bridging here. We've got a continuous layer of insulation. Um, it's thinner. The overall build up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You got anything to add to that build up there, John? No, no, nothing. Uh, nothing in particular. I mean, you, you, you layer at number five there as, as a drainage um, layer, mm. but it's actually going to work more as a drying layer. So you yes. just have to consider you've got vent, uh, you know, vented battens. So you just have to make sure that that ventilation is still available at um, Apex and Ave. Yep, for sure. All right. Um, that's, I'm going to um, summarise this up right now. Um, we've gone a little bit over time. 
Um, right, so what are we trying to say? Um, there's new requirements needed and to increase insulation in your roofs. Uh, we can't, there are ways to do it to comply, but please be aware of the unintended consequences, which include increasing condensation within that structure um, and all the, all the bad things that um, moisture does inside a building. Um, there's also the physical aspects to actually consider as well. I mean, I, I'm not sure how you actually maintain a gap with insulation on a ceiling line once you've got it sort of three to 400 mils thick. Um, consider your thermal bridging. Um, that has a massive effect on the overall performance. And I know that we've had roofs modeled before where the thermal bridging reduces the R value by almost 50%. Um, the other thing to consider is that PIR insulation is a useful way to reach these new requirements. It, it has a very high thermal efficiency and being rigid, it's easier to work with and lay on top of a roof, things like that. So, um, just and just to finish up our, our last slide here, we're going to um, release a, a design guide. This will be out next week. Um, it's a lot more in depth. Um, we'll uh, make this available to everybody who's attended today. Um, so we're quite excited to get that out. And um, that probably goes into a little bit more depth of what we've talked about today. Um, so we'll just leave that there. I appreciate we've, we have gone over a bit of time, but I, I still have a lot of questions coming in from the, from the audience, which is, which is quite good. Um, so I'm qu quite keen to run through some of those if, if you want to hang on in there. Um, first one I've got is, um, I like this one. This one's for you, John. Um, won't too much insulation cause my home to overheat? <laughs> No, no. Overheating is not caused by too much insulation. Um, the biggest culprit for overheating in homes is solar um, input, too much solar input, not enough control on keeping the sun out. It's, if you've got more insulation, uh, you're just slowing down the way that that leaves the house again. If yeah. you're overheating, put some shading in. Yeah. Right. Insulation does not, insulation is not a heater. If that makes sense to me. No, it's all good. Um, Scott, I've got another one here. Um, this is um, from a designer who wants to know uh, what is the thickness of the PIR we need um, to achieve an R value of 6.6 .6 in a residential building? Yeah, so the, the minimum is a 150 mil total thickness. We talked about two layers there, so you can layer that. An 80 and 70 is a, um, a good way to go. We do need to think about the, I guess, the the wind zone, mechanical fixings and such. We have a thermally broken flange that does help to offset any thermal bridging. But yeah, 150 mil minimum, that's um that's gonna get you there. Okay. Um right. Sorry guys. Um I've got another question here. Uh, I might be able to answer this one. It's on in regards to cost. Um, we see we see this come up quite a lot, and um, the cost of the warm roof versus a cold roof. Um, so there's a couple of things there I think that need to be considered. Um, one of the one of the options that we have for the the flat warm roof is to actually use a metal liner as the as the support for the PIR board. We don't necessarily need to use plywood and um, timber structure at 600 centres. Um, the actual timber construction and plywood is a relatively expensive component of the building. We can replace that with a, a metal tray that spans a lot further, uh, is a lot more economical, a lot faster to build. So if we look at the thing holistically, um, a, a warm roof on metal tray is actually more cost effective in our experience than a traditional cold roof. Um, and this ties into the next question that we've got here around what about near events? Um, so we, if we just flip back, sorry Jade, if we go back to slide, where are we? 12, I think it is. Yeah, uh, so it's 12, where are we? Get this one here, this is the, the cold room. So yeah, what about neuro events? Okay, um, so some time ago, we obviously, um, the, the industry realized there was an issue with condensation in these types of buildings. So we cut holes in them basically, and um, stuck a, a vent over it. Um, what we're doing there is we're actually allowing all that energy and, and investment you've used into conditioning that airspace to escape. Um, yes, it might take the moisture with it, um, but in some cases it could work the other way around. And um, 
there's no way to actually measure how much ventilation we need. And how that relates back to cost, well, each one of those vents, they cost, they have a cost associated with them. And then there's also a cost associated with the installation of it. So by the time you've put a vent every 40 square meters, you've basically um, gone to the price point of a warm roof. So uh, holistically, we believe that the warm roof is um, a lot better e economically as well. Um, right, sorry guys, just going through some, got lots of questions here. Um, you got anything to add on the cost there, Scott? Or? Um, oh, I think like anything, it needs to be looked at in, in context hmm. of the, the scenario. I mean, we work with designers and specifiers to look at the project and the different demands and requirements and, and balancing performance yeah. versus um, the materials that are used. I mean, yeah, I, I think it really does need to be weighed up. And I mean, that's something that myself and our team are very active with. Um, so definitely reach out to us and we can talk to you about your project and look at different ways that we can, uh, you know, you mentioned Shane, metal tray versus plywood. That's mm -hmm. quite a common change that we, we see. And that is it's lighter, faster to install. Uh, we have different membrane systems, you know, so, but yeah, the, um, it's all a case of weighing it up. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, look, I've just got one more question to go. If we just want to flip to slide 13, Jade. Um, sorry, we're not going to get an opportunity to answer all these questions. What we will do, though, is that we capture all these questions, we put them into a document, and this is all sent out to all the attendees today um, with, a, with a written Q&A, so everyone will see all the questions and all the answers. We'll um, endeavour to answer all of them. Um, this last question is around about uh, John's favourite topic of thermal bridging. So. Um, in this, this diagram, we haven't actually shown how this thing's built, right? So um, one of the things we do at Neurolite is we use a thermally broken fastener, which is a, a hollow plastic tube um, to try and eliminate that thermal bridging. Because um, John, you would agree that the you know, driving a 200 mil screw from the top to the bottom will have an effect on the thermal performance? Yeah, sure. Yep. And, and you just need to consider how much that does affect. Um, I'd suggest that it's a whole lot less than a big piece of steel running through that space, mm -hmm. uh, like a, like a purlin. Yeah. But yeah, just you, you measure it, you find out how much it is, and you you yeah, Excellent. take so that, take I mean, it the, into the account. The other method to remove it all together is we actually have the ability to ad adhesively fix this whole thing together, so there isn't a single mechanical fixing through the whole thing. All right, folks, I'm going to wrap it up there. We're going to finish off this Q&A session in a Word document. It'll all go back out to everybody with the recording. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, thanks very much for your um, participation in order for us to donate to a very worthy cause. Um, thank you very much, John, for attending and your, your science brain. I hope you start to feel a bit better. Okay. Good on you, mate. And um, Scott, thank you for your, your input, mate. And um, we're going to uh, we'll leave it there. So thanks very much for attending. Um, this recording will be available. We'll get it out to everybody, and um, we'll go from there. All right. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.